Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for our webinar on using open licensing to support LGBTQ inclusive learning. My name is Meredith Jacob and I'm the public lead for Creative Commons USA and a lawyer who works on issues related to copyright, fair use, and open licensing. Uh, our webinar today is covering how to understand the ways in which open licensing can support and enable LGBTQ inclusive learning if we examine the sort of existing structural system and how to use the flexibilities enabled by open licensing to consciously make uh, change and improvement. So through this webinar, we're going to be talking about uh, open educational resources, which are teaching and learning materials that are uh, produced and then released under a open copyright license, usually a Creative Commons license. And these open educational resources can be any type of teaching or learning material like a traditionally uh, copyrighted one, but instead that are free for anyone to use or duplicate. And this freedom allows us in theory to create materials that are uh, more broadly representational and inclusive, but like anything else, if we don't examine the sort of existing um, structural power system and the ways in which that works, the tools themselves, the tools of licensing that allow us to create open educational resources will not automatically create a sort of more broad or progressive future. So to talk about the um, structure of using openly licensed materials to uh, do better work in LGBTQ inclusive teaching and learning, I would like to introduce my colleague Sabia Prescott. Sabia is a policy analyst with the Education Policy Program at New America. Prior to doing, joining New America, Sabia served as the Media Policy Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Global Communication Studies. Sabia, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Meredith. And hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm so glad to be here to be able to talk with you all. Um, could we advance to the next slide? So uh, as Meredith mentioned, my name is Sabia. I work um, at New America, which is a DC-based policy think tank. There, I work specifically on a team called Teaching, Learning, and Tech. And most of my work focuses on how to use ed tech tools and open licensing to advance uh, queer and trans inclusion in teaching and learning, specifically in pre-K, which is what I'll focus on today. Next slide, please. So before I get started, I want to offer a little bit of language um, so that we're on the same page and so that when you hear these terms come up uh, in this presentation that you know what we're talking about. The first one is LGBTQ, right? It stands for uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. Um, this acronym and, and any variations of it that you might hear or might have heard before are, of course, an umbrella term um, that uh, represent both gender and sexual, uh, sexual orientation um, identities. Another phrase for this is gender and sexual minorities. I like this one. I think it's a little bit more self-explanatory, but it's also a little bit less common. And then lastly, queer and trans, just kind of another sort of informal uh, umbrella term for, for gender and sexual orientation uh, identities and people. Um, for the purpose of this presentation, I do sort of stick to these umbrella terms. Um, and then the last thing that I've linked here, I think the, the slide deck will be available um, after this webinar. And so I've linked um, Teaching Tolerance's full sort of laundry list of, of every, every word and definition um, that, that you might want to know about LGBTQ identities in case you'd like to go there and learn a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. So what is LGBTQ inclusion, right? What are we talking about when we say this and, um, and what does it mean? So uh, some of the things that, that I'll cover over the next 15 minutes or so are what does it mean, right? <laughs> what are we talking about? Who are we talking about um, when we're talking about queer and trans students and teachers and educators and inclusive classrooms? Um, when is it possible? Just a quick spoiler, it's possible always, every time. Um, where does it happen? Where can it happen? Where should it happen? Where doesn't it happen? And then lastly, why are we talking about it? And I'll actually start with this first because I think this is important for, for ground setting here, right? Um, there, there sort of remains a, an egregious dearth of research on queer and trans students in schools and their experiences. But all the research that does exist would tell you that outcomes um, and experiences for queer and trans students are far worse, um, far below. Whatever, whatever it is that you're looking at, um, the outcomes are worse than they are for their non-LGBTQ peers. Um, they graduate at lower rates, they're bullied at higher rates, they see themselves reflected in materials and in the classroom far less, um, and that's where we're going to focus today. Next slide, please. 
So when we talk about queer inclusive materials and resources, um, how I think about it are those that allow everyone, even and especially students of gender and sexual minority identities, to see themselves accurately represented and reflected both in the materials, but also in the classroom, in the type of pedagogy, in the um, instructional practices. I'm seeing uh, Rudine Sims Bishop cited more and more lately, it seems, um, for her idea of mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, right? And that's the idea that students need to see, uh, need to be taught rather with resources that do those three things, right? And have mirrors um, hold, allow themselves to see themselves reflected and represented in the curriculum, right? Ones that present windows for them to see into the experiences and lives of people who hold identities that are different from their own. And the last piece is the sliding glass doors, right, which actually lets them step into those experiences, empathize a little bit more, and really fully understand. Um, I think that this, this idea extends well to LGBTQ students because they almost always see windows and seldom see mirrors, right? They're never, I don't want to say never, they're very, very seldom represented or reflected in the material. And this has a big impact on socio-emotional learning um, and on the ways that they feel engaged um, and included in the classroom. And that, of course, has, um, has big impacts on the outcomes for LGBTQ students. Next slide, please. So when we talk about queer inclusive materials, right, what do they do? Um, what do they actually look like? When I'm thinking about queer inclusive materials, I think about those that promote gender diversity through pronoun use, right? Pronouns are really important to a lot of LGBTQ folks um, to see uh, content that offers a variety of names, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, pronouns and language is really important. Queer inclusive materials tell stories across the LGBTQ community, right? Like every other group of people who have ever been categorized, there is no one LGBTQ experience or story or narrative. Um, and so truly inclusive materials present a variety of different stories within this community. Queer inclusive materials evolve with our understanding of LGBTQ identities, right? Um, the language that we have to describe queer identities and experiences and people is different from, from 10 years ago from five years ago, right? If you were to look back at a textbook from, from 30 years ago, if there had been a textbook 30 years ago that talked about LGBTQ people and identities, the language would not be the same as the language we would use today, probably. And so um, inclusive materials are those that are relevant um, and accurate in terms of what we currently understand about queer people. And then lastly, queer inclusive materials challenge bias, right? Sort of simply by existing, they challenge what we, what we know to be natural and given and um, stereotypical and sort of uh, work against those things in productive ways, um, in ways that are productive, I should say, to all students, not just to LGBTQ students. Next slide, please. And I think just, just as important to note is what queer inclusive materials don't do, right? And what they don't look like. Um, Queer inclusive materials don't rely on gender stereotypes. They don't rely on racial stereotypes, right? Um, sort of danger that arises when we include only one type of, of queer identity, only one type of story, only one narrative is that it's sort of by default going to be that of the most privileged among us, right? And for queer and trans people, that's white cisgender men, right? Um, to illustrate this a little bit, I, I have people tell me all the time that they like to show the movie Love, Simon in their classrooms, right? If you're not familiar, Love, Simon is a, is a coming of age story of a cisgender white uh, teenage boy, right? Um, who, as he turns out, his parents are, are accepting, they're a nuclear family, they live in the suburbs. <laughs> it's sort of, um, it holds all other things constant in a way, except for gender, um, except for his gender and sexual orientation. And so um, it's not that that's not a good or productive story that we should include, but it's not the only one. And when that is the only one um, that you include in classrooms or in materials or in examples or word problems or whatever it looks like, um, that sort of becomes the idea that is associated with an entire community of people and sort of cancels everything else out, right? Like that's it, that's the queer story. Um, relatedly, queer inclusive materials uh, don't portray only this one type of queer identity. Um, one of my favorite authors, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, uh, gives this great TED talk about the idea of the, her idea of the single story narrative. And it's sort of this, right? That when we have one story um, that is the only story that is allowed to exist or allowed to be told about an entire group of people, that, that just becomes the only story, right? And all the other nuance, all the other identities and types of experiences of people who hold um, any identities within the umbrella of LGBTQ um, are sort of forced off to the side and not, not told ever. 
And then lastly, queer inclusive materials don't include LGBTQ characters and examples without culturally relevant context. Um, they don't simply replace pronouns and names um, that are understood and assumed to be a particular thing and represent a particular person without understanding the sort of the cultural context and the examples um, that are used in that, in that content or in those word problems again or whatever it is um, at the same time. Next slide, please. So what does OER have to do with this, right? Where does, where does open licensing um, come into play when we're talking about queer and trans inclusion? I know this is not a sort of logical um, bridge in a lot of people's minds, but I think it can be a useful tool. One of those reasons is that anyone can access and adapt OER, right? As Zoe will talk about a little bit later, um, there are fewer gatekeepers in OER, right? And so more people have the chance just by virtue of it being open to um, author stories, author content, create and curate content, even offer things like framing and, um, and just sort of thinking around particular ideas because it's not just one or a small handful of people who, who are writing a textbook, for example, um, who are sort of deciding this narrative. The second is that, again, OER can be adapted and updated to reflect an evolving understanding of LGBTQ identities, right? It need not be outdated in the way that textbooks often are. And so I think for this, uh, for this population specifically, it's actually a really useful tool for that. And then lastly, OER is just becoming more widely used, right? It's this thing that more and more people are using and, and everyone has access to, and we ought to make that thing that everyone has access to quality. And in this case, quality means inclusive. Next slide, please. So what do we do with this, right? How do I make my materials inclusive? Um, and I want to offer these sort of three types of inclusion. Um, and this can be used, I think, whether or not you're creating uh, materials yourself, you're writing the content, or you're looking to make them more, you're looking to make open materials um, more inclusive because they're adaptable. So the first is gender language, right? Um, names and pronouns are a big piece of this. Names can be a little bit tricky, right, because anyone um, with any name can be any gender. Um, but that said, certain, especially outside the queer community, certain names are sort of read and understood as particular genders. So uh, offering or including rather a variety of names and pronouns and content can be really important for students. The second is visual representation, right? Um, who appears in the photos um, that you're using in the, in the videos that you're using or any other sort of visual um, media that is included in your instructional materials. Um, again, there's a way to do this without without tokenizing people in videos, and that is to to make sure that you have a wide variety um, of people, uh, not just LGBTQ people, but um, everyone <laughs> in your videos to the extent that it's possible, and also to the extent that it's um, you're not just sort of substituting. Um, photos and videos with with uh, people that you think should be there without actually changing uh, your content as well and making sure that it, it makes sense together. The last one is non-LGBTQ specific inclusion, right? Um, is, it, is the content accessible? Is it ADA compliant? Um, can everyone access it equally? Can everyone um, read it equally and digest that information? Do the examples in it, um, are they able to be understood by people who don't have um, then the particular experiences of the authors? Um, who authored the content, right? Um, who, who, if it's open materials, who had the option to um, to reflect on that content, to um, give input to it, and to review it before it was sort of um, presented to students? All of these things, sort of, um, not sort of, all of these things have have an immense impact on what the final content is and how it affects students. So, next slide, please. So my last thing that, that I just like to leave you with um, is a couple of resources. The first is a quest, these are all linked. Um, so if you look back through the slides, you can see these. Um, the first one is just a list of questions beyond the ones that I just very briefly presented um, to ask of the content. Again, when you're, when you're looking at it, when you're considering creating content or considering making existing content more queer and trans inclusive, um, these are some questions that you can ask of the content to make sure that you're sort of um, hitting different benchmarks in terms of inclusion. The second and third are um, a little bit more in-depth uh, reports and um, series on inclusive, using OER rather, for LGBTQ inclusive teaching and then learning. Again, I've linked Teaching Tolerance's glossary. It's a really great one-on-one -on -one place to start. And then the last one is a list of uh, 
just sort of more broad uh, LGBTQ pre-K-12 specific <laughs> um, education resources um, that I curate uh, based on what I hear from folks is most useful. So hopefully that'll be useful for you as well. And that's it for me. Thanks so much. Oh, sorry, there's one more slide. <laughs> it's just my information. And so on the next slide, we just have uh, Sabia's contact information. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, these slide decks and the recording itself will be available next week on the link that we put in the chat. Thank you so much, Sabia. And I think that that's a really important sort of baseline of the, the minimal set of things where if you're creating OER content, <clears throat> that you wanna make sure that you're doing so in a way that <clears throat> just as you wanna make sure that you're creating content that is accessible for students with disabilities, you're creating content that is accurate in the underlying substance that it teaches that you create content that is also representative of the full spectrum of student experiences that you have in your class. So on the next slide, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Jasmine Roberts. Jasmine is a lecturer at the School of Communications at The Ohio State University, where she teaches upper level undergraduate courses in the areas of communication campaigns and strategic communication writing. Uh, Professor Roberts advocacy work centers on the experiences of people of color, women and queer communities. Thank you so much for joining us. All right, thanks so much for that introduction. I'm really excited to um, get started. So I'm gonna discuss um, how we can imagine and practically include LGBTQ plus um, voices in higher education. A little bit what that looks like in terms of content, um, but I realize that will also be discussed later on. So I think I wanna focus a little less on that. Um, instead, I want to focus more on what happens when we give space to LGBTQ plus individuals and scholars and, um, you know, how does that further complicate what we know in our ways of producing knowledge? Um, how does that help us to tell a more complete story and how can we use OER and open licensing as a tool to accomplish this goal? So, next slide. So it's a statement I get all the time from people um, within and outside of academia is where did all these gay people come from? <laughs> Literally <laughs> that question. Um, it seems like, you know, it's increasing or something. There's something in the water. And, and to that, you know, those type of questions, my response is always, we, we've always been here, you know, and, and the same goes for LGBTQ plus individuals in academia. Um, we've been here and, and there is a little bit of evidence of that. Um, I, I want to acknowledge, however, that it is a, a little difficult to label um, scholars from the past as queer um, or to quantify sexual and gender diversity because of, you know, of course, the social climate of the past. But there is a little bit of evidence that implies some form of LGBTQ plus presence in the academy um, in the past. So for example, we have um, Michael Wigglesworth, a student at Harvard, way back in the 1600s, who in his writing reported some feelings of same-sex attraction to his peers, who of course, you know, we're talking about Harvard in the 1600s, predominantly white men. Um, and then um, also, of course, uh, Ralph, not of course, but Ralph Waldo um, Emerson implied in some of his works some same-sex attraction um, while at Harvard. And more recently, we have the following queer scholars, right? So we have Catherine Mack, who's an astrophysicist and um, assistant professor at North Carolina State University, who's bisexual. Um, Anna Castillo, who is a poet, independent scholar, who is also bisexual. Um, ben Barris, who was a neurobiologist, a transgender man. Um, Audrey Lord, a very well-known lesbian feminist and Eduardo, Eduardo, excuse me, Machado, who teaches at NYU and is um, openly gay. Um, next slide. So, you know, despite these contributions and me listing just an example of queer scholars in the academy and their presence, we still see an erasure of queer scholars, queer voices, queer lived experiences in education. When they are named as such, it typically is in a class that focuses on issues related to sex, sexuality, gender, and again, related issues. So what this does is it, it further marginalizes queer lived experiences and fails to acknowledge how um, queer experiences can be a source of knowledge. And again, I think we see this eraser because, or erasure, excuse me, because educators are either unaware of, you know, the fact that there are certain scholars who are queer 
And, and to me, and again, I might be going, you know, out on a limb here, but I think it's okay to say queer um, or whatever appropriate term when we are talking about queer scholars in the classroom, because with that term, um, we then name the lived experiences that we need to consider um, in academia. And I think even outside of traditional academic scholarship, we of course, we, we need to make sure that those experiences are centered in our texts and in, in our classrooms. Next slide. So we, we see this in the very timely discussion about Black Lives Matter. Um, many people still do not know that the founders are, are Black women, let alone Alicia and Patrice here. They are queer Black women. And um, they are actually a really interesting case because they represent a resistance to automatically racialize, you know, LGBTQ plus experiences as white or to automatically gender race as cisgender black men or to automatically label the sexuality of black women as heterosexual. So we, we definitely see this erasure of queer history or herstory, I want to say, when and more so if <laughs> we discuss Black Lives Matter in the classroom. And so um, this, of course, is problematic because the framework of Black Lives Matter is based on Black queer feminism and intersectionality. So if we are not teaching it this way because we are not acknowledging how their queer experiences have contributed to this very important social movement, I mean, we're, we're doing it a disjustice or, you know, we're not, we're not doing it justice. And of course, Black Lives Matter means not only valuing cisgender straight Black men's lives, but you know, Black trans women, Black trans men, um, Black non-binary folks, <laughs> Black cisgender women, all of that. But again, we, we cannot know this if we do not center the queer lens that is so foundational to the Black Lives Matter movement. Next slide. So how does OER um, fit into all this? So, so like what was stated earlier, um, Sabia was saying, uh, because of the uh, open license piece, we can adapt our content accordingly to make sure that we are speaking to these queer experiences, right? But when I talk to faculty across the nation about making changes and customizing their content to make it a little more inclusive, um, they might say something like, well, I can't find a queer scholar in my field, which kind of makes me feel like, well, I don't want you to tokenize <laughs> your work. Um, so what you could do, of course, is leverage third party sources or pop culture sources and still use that scholarly lens to talk about these examples in the classroom and include that in your, your OER. And this is especially important because we know that although there are queer scholars represented in disciplines across the board, for the most part at least, academia still privileges scholarship from cisgender heterosexual white men. And I also always challenge faculty and educators with these questions as they go about their course content selection, right? So when you are selecting content in your course in general, but especially for your OER, um, whose voices are you centering because of this decision that you've made? And as a result, whose voices are you leaving on the margins? And more importantly, because of those decisions, who gets the privilege and the power behind that representation, behind that visibility, and behind centering um, their knowledge? Next slide. So, um, Ultimately, we, we need to champion and bring queer culture more into the center of OER because it, it offers a more um, liberated way of engaging in educational resources. It, it, it deprograms us from you know, what we know. And, and that's why I included a little bit of the content that you see here on this slide. Um, it's actually from a meme that was <laughs> really popular. I think it was a year or two ago. But it discusses what queer culture can teach people in general. We need to talk about this more in, in academia and higher education. So, you know, what would happen if, for example, we have an OER that speaks to the work of Mark Schell, who's a Canadian literary scholar, but is further complicated by the works of Audre Lorde, uh, again, a well-known Black lesbian feminist. So, you know, centering this queer culture, being queer, and centering, again, these queer experiences in OER, uh, for me, is a commitment to liberation. Next slide. And that's all uh, for me. Thank you so much for, for listening to me. And um, yeah. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And I think, you know, it's really important to think about the connection between 
broader representation that um, Sabia talked about and also broadening authorship in the way that you did because it's not really effective to say we'd like more inclusive and representational materials without also thinking about how to include people in the authorship and ownership of those. So thank you so much for joining us and looking forward to talking more in the Q&A. Up next, it is my pleasure to introduce Zoe Wei Kai. Zoe is the Assistant Director of the Rebus Foundation and has worked extensively in supporting authorship and materials creation in the open educational world through her work at the Rebus community. Uh, next slide, please. And Zoe, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Meredith. And big thanks to Sabia and Jasmine for starting us off so well. I really appreciate the work that you both do. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, creation and publishing specifically. So how does the, the kind of materials that we really want to see uh, get made? Um, starting with the opportunities that are created in the OER space, but also considering some of the barriers that remain um, and for, for queer creators, but also for, for others uh, looking to do this work, because it's certainly not all on queer creators to, uh, to create inclusive content. Next slide, please. Thank you. So to start, the huge advantage of OER uh, that I see, or certainly one of them, is that it does away with traditional gatekeepers. In typical uh, publishing processes, the decision making about what gets published is retained by a very small group of people uh, who are guided by a pretty narrow set of uh, structures and priorities. And that decision making process holds an immense amount of power. What we decide or what someone decides should get published is a value statement about it, it, it being something that should exist in the world. Uh, and so within traditional publishers, the, that process is really held quite tightly um, and is, is limited uh, in, in the kinds of ideas of what, what content should be are accepted. Uh, it, that happens in two ways and they're closely linked, uh, but, but can be talked about separately. One is in the priorities and the structures. The other is in the decision makers and, and how they then influence those structures. Uh, so to start within traditional publishers, the, particularly in the, the academic space uh, and within the textbook space, the priorities are typically on content that they see as being broad or generic. The irony being, being that that often leads to having a very narrow view of who is actually using the content at the end of the day, uh, and quite a narrow view of, say, a typical student who will be picking up a textbook and what needs to be seen there. So in service of trying to be generic, um, they're actually making decisions about what that means, and that centers, uh, it centers straight experiences, it centers whiteness, um, and centers uh, other dominant cultures and cultural practices. So closely linked to those kinds of priorities are the people who are doing the work, and I think it's important to, to acknowledge the, um, the, the <laughs> fairly major drawbacks in, in the way that the publishing industry operates. Uh, and if we can head to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so I, I set out to find some breakdowns of the, the representation within the publishing industry. Uh, now, I wasn't able to find anything particularly related to queer representation uh, in academic or textbook publishing, which I think in itself says a lot. I think there is a large gap there that we're not paying attention to, um, to who's involved in the work. Uh, but this study from Lee and Low Books is an excellent uh, kind of, it's based on the trade publishing industry, um, but certainly gives us an insight into the breakdown of uh, the industry and this slide here is is the industry overall with a few stats there about who is represented um, this is their 2019 study and they also uh, produced a study in 2015 and so i've been able to see an evolution uh, which i found quite interesting so one of the the uh, the comments that's made in the the details of the um the survey is that according to the survey about 81 percent of publishing staff identify as straight or heterosexual this category saw the most change over the course of the study, so that's between 2015 and 2019. In the initial survey, 88% of respondents self-reported as straight. This survey saw a statistically significant negative change in the number of res respondents that self-reported straight at 81%. That change can largely be attributed to the number that identified as bi and pansexual at 10%. And not, not surprisingly, most of these are white women, but that again is most likely attributed to the fact that the field is overwhelmingly white women. 
there was a slight drop in gay representation to 4%, lesbian to 2%, and asexual holding at 1%. So there's some measure of progress visible there, uh, but if we go to the next slide, I really want to um, point out something that was very telling in the information. When they break down the, uh, the representation by role within the industry, the vast majority of that change is visible in interns. So there are ways in which the, the, uh, there are pathways into the publishing industry, but it's really uh, for queer and trans people. Um, although actually I, I should note the 0% the on, on trans representation here within the interns was particularly concerning. Uh, and so there are some avenues in, um, but it's really yet to be seen whether there are, are structural changes that will uh, retain those people and, and allow them to fully bring their experiences to the work that they do and have that then impact content that's created. Next slide, please. So with gatekeepers gone, um, that's really fantastic. People can choose to do creation and don't need to rely on, on a publisher uh, to, to allow them to do that work, which is fantastic. Um, but there are still barriers to doing that work that remain. In the case of going it alone and choosing to create your own work, uh, first of all, that's an enormous time investment, which is not always possible for people to invest. Um, there's also no fi financial compensation in that situation when you are uh, choosing to do a project alone with no financial backing from an institution or, or a publisher. And the other thing is that when uh, operating alone, it's sometimes hard to, uh, to achieve wider adoption of the materials that you create without a marketing structure to kind of leverage that. Um, so one of the ways that I think we've, in the OER community, we've done a good job of trying to support folks so they don't need to go it alone is through institutional programs, um, which do introduce at least some, some measure of gatekeeping because decisions are made by a very small team within an institution about who receives funding for the work that they're doing. So they are still somewhat of a gatekeeper. The other thing is the stipends available are very, very limited. Um, we know that they aren't, you know, they, they're certainly not an hourly rate or anything close to it for the work that goes into creating OER. Um, and in any, uh, at any point when we're talking about labour, uh, unpaid labour or low paid labour um, that privileges uh, certain people in terms of access, there are, there are uh, groups who are able to undertake that and those tend to be those who already have a lot of privilege. And the other thing with institutional programs is that there are really varying degrees of support. Um, so while someone might, might uh, receive a stipend, what happens next um, can range from a very you know, well handled process through to being left more in the going it alone situation, but just with a little bit of money to, to, um, to kind of recognize their work. Uh, and it's also important to, to recognize the risk that's inherent in openness and that it is not evenly distributed. Not everybody undertakes or, or accepts the same level of risk by engaging in work done in the open. Again, this intersects with, intersects with precarity in academia, those who are able to give the time. Um, there's also, uh, you know, I think in, in the, it, with questions of queer representation, there's a history of misrepresentation. Uh, and so it's understandable that there is a, a desire by many in our community to want to control the narrative more than has been, they've been able to in the past. Um, and so that can introduce some, some tension or, or, uh, or concern or hesitancy around doing open work. Um, and it's hard to <laughs> sum this up in a way that doesn't seem flippant, but the internet exists. When you're doing work openly, that means an amount of public work as well. Uh, and there's a real risk um, involved in that of uh, all kinds of repercussions, both personal and professional, that can come back on somebody engaging on that kind of work. Um, and then finally, there is also uh, a risk that I've often discussed and her discussed in the context of accessibility where because an open text can be remediated to become you know to be more accessible or to be more inclusive uh, I, I always have the concern that that then comes across as well I don't have to do that work because somebody else can and that's absolutely not the case first of all because we all have a responsibility to do this work together it's not on just the queer community to create inclusive content and also because it is harder to do in the, the remediation uh, phase rather than building it in upfront. If we ensure that content is inclusive from day one and make sure we have our, our structures around publishing and creation uh, geared towards that goal, um, then the, the content that comes out the end of that process is much stronger um, and, and requires much less work to adapt to any given context. 
Next slide, please. So next, I wanted to explore some ways in which we can include queer creators within uh, the OER work that is happening. And this is particularly targeted at uh, folks who are running um, institutional programs. And so wanted to run, run through some strategies to ensure that you are supporting um, as best uh, you can queer creators within your community, uh, within your campus community. So it starts with recruitment. Um, one place to start is with the language that you use in a call for proposals and spend some time workshopping that to ensure that it is uh, specific and inviting uh, proposals from uh, people in all underrepresented um, groups, but certainly in this context uh, for, for queer creators. There is a world of uh, resources available to help you do that, um, typically around things like uh, uh, job postings and um, so you can leverage the same kind of input to create an, an inclusive call for proposals. It's also important to develop relationships on campus and you know I said with peer groups I think really how I think about this is doing the work of being an ally outside of your OER recruitment process essentially. So if you put in the work to be involved with queer groups on campus, including student groups, um, do the work to make sure that whenever you're talking about OER, you're talking about it as an avenue to create inclusive classroom environments. If you're consistently doing that work, that gets recognized and seen. Um, and so people aren't, uh, you know, coming into a process and, and not really knowing what reaction they might get or, or what treatment that might get. Um, it's important too to be deliberate in reaching out to people rather than just waiting to see who comes to you. Uh, that often ends up with um, the, the loudest voices in the room uh, kind of effect where, where people who respond to a call for proposals are, are, um, are those who are willing to put themselves out there in, um, in an opportunity like this. So you can also spend time reaching out and, and again developing those relationships and making sure you're doing active work to, to find uh, queer creators to be a part of your program. Um, uh, very important too to not just recruit them in to create LGBTQ studies content that is obviously very valuable and yes we should fund that too um, but queer people do all kinds of things uh, and are experts in all kinds of things and, and can contribute in all kinds of ways um, and it's also really important to remember that the queer community is not a monolith um, so when you're looking at uh, having queer representation again you know as has been said very well um, in the, the previous presentations that doesn't mean just uh, you know just one kind of uh, LGBTQ faculty member or, or, um, or a student who's involved in the, in the process. Uh, the next phase then is ongoing support. Um, I think it's really important to structure programs to support creators over time. Um, by you know, paying a stipend and leaving people to their own devices, it increases the risk of failure. And failure sticks to people in marginalized communities in academia more so than it does to those who are privileged. So if you know, if, if a creator isn't supported to complete their work and that kind of goes up as a, a, as a kind of um, a negative against them or, or may, may come back to them in all sorts of ways. So when you're involving somebody in opportunities like this, you have a responsibility to them um, to, to really make sure that, that they have the best chance of success, which means support over time. Um, the other thing I really encourage is fostering community with other OER uh, folks on campus so that they have the support of a community um, who are also invested in the work that they're doing. Um, find whatever ways you can to frame OER work as professional development, create leadership opportunities, write recommendation letters, however else you can leverage their OER work into supporting the career advancement of, uh, of, um, of the people who are involved in your program and, and particularly those who already have a more difficult path through uh, the academic structure uh, can be really valuable. Next slide please. So to come back to the question of non-queer creators, um, if you're running a program, you also have a responsibility to make sure that everybody is invested in this work. Uh, and again, some concrete ways to do that. Ask upfront in the grant application for them to address how they will ensure that content is inclusive. And then provide resources to help them to do so. Uh, what Sabia shared earlier is a fantastic set of resources uh, that you could draw on to, to ensure that everybody who is participating in OER creation within your institution um, is doing so with inclusivity and, and more than just in mind, but is actively equipped to do that work. Uh, I think it's important too to consider who else will be touching a project uh, and peer reviewers is um, a clear group who will likely become involved in an OER project. 
Um, and so at that point, that's another opportunity to ensure that you have a, a diverse team of reviewers who can bring their perspectives and work to, uh, to ensure that the, the content is inclusive and also work to introduce new ways that you can think about that too. Um, and also ensure that uh, your OER projects are going through classroom review. The creation of OER is in service of the students in the classroom. So we need to know from them, does it work? Does it resonate? What stands out? What's done well? What isn't? Um, and classroom review is something that, uh, you know, in our work with Reapers Community, we really try to put on the same level as peer review. You need to know that content is accurate. You also need to know that it is functional for its purpose. Um, and so those two processes together are very powerful. And then finally, I did want to, um, you know, make sure that I address uh, <laughs> another point here, which is about those of us within the queer, queer community. This isn't just about allyship and, and, and queer creators. Um, you know, I am I'm a white, cis, straight passing woman. I move through spaces very differently than a lot of my queer peers. And I have power in those spaces um, that they often don't have access to and those of us in a position similar to mine in whatever way you have power and privilege we have a responsibility to leverage it and to leverage it in support of other queer people with whom we're connected um, again that can come in the place of recommending people for opportunities that you may come across because of your access to um, to a space nominating people for awards for opportunities writing letters of support and collaborating. So when you do have the opportunity to do work in a knowing our context, ensuring that you are taking on the responsibility as well of making sure that you're not the only queer voice in that space, um, because there is so much more uh, to the queer experience than what any one of us can, uh, can experience in our lifetimes. And next slide, I think that was it for me. Um, I, Twitter details are there if you're interested in the work we do with Reapers Community. Um, we're, we're trying to support this kind of work where people can do publishing on their own terms and adapt the process to, to whatever suits um, within their context. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zoe. I think that was really useful. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the connections between copyright and open licensing with these larger goals of broadening inclusion and working towards equity. This can seem like a sort of disconnected topic. And so I want to talk through how there might be ways in which understanding and utilizing both the um, open licensing system and also the underlying users rights, specifically fair use and the copyright system can help you create um, better teaching materials. Next slide, please. So why talk about copyright? Uh, the first part is when you are adapting existing openly licensed material, when you're adapting material that is under a Creative Commons license, um, you need to understand how the licenses work to allow you to make materials better, to make them more inclusive and representative, to update them to current um, understandings and standards about how we talk about different groups of people, and also to engage students themselves as authors. One of the ways to make materials more reflective of student experience is also to open it up to student authorship. So openly licensed materials allow us to make those modifications within the copyright system. The other thing to think about is when we are creating new openly licensed teaching materials, when we're creating new OER, um, creating openly licensed materials is not a closed book test, right? You don't sit um, in isolation and create these materials from only your imagination. You have to engage with an existing cultural materials and you need to cover topics that are not covered in maybe the existing corpus of textbooks and finally in that process we want to make the the work of engaging with open licensing and um, being brave about fair use something that feels supported and feels safe because if our goal is to broaden access to authorship then we need to not just say hey Here's a set of tools. If you explore it, if you understand it, then you can be an author. But how are we actively working at reaching out to people and making these tools um, valuable and meaningful to them? Next slide, please. So um, just to make sure we're all on the same baseline, as we said earlier, open educational resources can be any teaching and learning materials under a CC license. And those Creative Commons licenses make the materials free to the public to use, adapt, and redistribute as long as attribution is provided. 
separately in the creation of materials if you want to engage with existing third-party copyrighted stuff that's not under an open license. The primary way you'll do that is to rely on fair use, which is a doctrine in US copyright law that permits the use of third-party copyrighted materials in specific circumstances. On the next slide, um, you'll see uh, the Creative Commons license image. So if you have an openly licensed material, um, if you're the author and you want to put it out under an open license, the way you do that is to mark it with the license image and the license text here, which links back to the full legal license. And as a user, if you see something that is marked with the Creative Commons license, a document that already has it or a photo or a video or anything else, that those things are open for you to update or adapt or reuse as long as you provide attribution back. Next slide, please. So this is sort of a flowchart to think through as you're trying to understand what you can do when you are either updating a material or creating something new. So your first question is, is the thing I want to use or is the thing I want to do protected by copyright law at all? And so copyright law protects a lot of things. It protects um, the, the duplication, the distribution, the performance of anything that's within the scope of copyright. And copyright covers most artistic work. So it covers writing, it covers photographs, music, uh, dance, video. These things are all protected by copyright law. But it's important to remember that copyright law does not protect the idea within those things. It protects the specific expression. So while in an academic sense, you might need to provide attribution for the ideas from a copyright law standpoint, ideas are separate from the expression. So if you're writing about someone else's ideas, you might need to give them credit from an ethical standpoint, but copyright law doesn't lock that down. Um, also, many works created in 1924 uh, or earlier are in the public domain, and those can also be used for free um, without any copyright restrictions. But um, as was mentioned by earlier speakers, you don't want to let uh, copyright risk be the way that you make your choices about authorship, right? We know a lot about how materials that are in the public domain, materials created before 1924, are going to reflect a very um, narrow segment of society that had access to authorship. If we want to create materials that engage with the broadest possible cultural experiences, we need to not just limit ourselves to things that are in the public domain or things that are so old as to be not protected by copyright. We also need to engage with existing materials. And so if you want to engage with something that is out there in the world that is modern and that reflects um, the lived experience of your students, you may need to rely on fair use. Fair use is a user's right in the US copyright system that allows you to use third party materials in specific situations, including for critique and review and educational purposes. We're going to talk about that a little more. Um, but just as a reminder, even if something isn't fair use, if it is out under a Creative Commons license, you can still use that material in its entirety. Next slide. So if you're evaluating, say you're creating a, um, a lesson on the history of film and you want to use clips from different movies to talk about how something is treated in film. Two core questions that you have to ask yourself to evaluate with fair use are, are you doing something new and different, something transformative, and is the amount you're using a part or the whole appropriate? And if the answer to those is both yes, then it's unlikely you're providing a substitute in the market, which is the only sort of market harm factor in fair use. So this is sort of deep in the copyright uh, nerdery and seems really disconnected from these questions about inclusion, equity, and justice. But the reason I think it's important is very often people sort of self-censor and choose a sort of um, blander, more uh, typical or sort of dominant culture view of all of their examples because there's this hesitance to rely on a broad sector of real world examples. So um, there's been questions in the chat of, you know, how do I start if I'm not a member of the LGBTQ community, how do I do a responsible job of representation? One answer is to do the work of going through this fair use analysis and to include examples that exist already that are out there in the real world 
of people with different identities representing themselves, of not trying to sort of create, often I think in OER, there's this urge to avoid copyright confusion by creating your own new substitution. But I think um, authenticity and authorial voice is really important. And so that substitution can end up um, sort of muting or narrowing the actual sort of range of lived experience. Uh, next slide, please. So if you said, okay, I do wanna use this example. I think it enriches my materials. It makes them more representational. It improves the inclusiveness. You need to think through implementing that fair use. You need to think through what is your purpose? What is your pedagogical purpose, including uh, your purpose in terms of broadly speaking to your students' experience? Then you ask yourself the question, is this a transformative purpose? Is it different than the purpose for the original? Often this might be the original had a pop culture performance or a news documentary performance, or it was in literature, and here you're using it for an educational purpose. And then the question of whether it substitutes in the market for the original. For most teaching purposes, these questions will come back to what is your pedagogy, including the social emotional component of that. Um, once you've made the decision to include third party materials, you need to document what's under your open license and what's excluded because it's being used under fair use and identify those third party materials. And you can um, also document what your reasoning is. Next slide. So at that point, we've sort of tried to provide a baseline of how to think through fair use questions um, and how they can really allow you to create teaching materials that are broader and more representational um, and how also while open licensing allows a um, sort of de-institutionalizing of authorship, of spreading it out, of making authorship available to more people, um, that if we don't work through sharing power and rethinking sort of traditional hierarchical assignment of authorship that the tool itself will not do that for us. So we have about um, 25 minutes left for questions. I'd like to introduce two additional commentators who will join us for questions, and then we'll go to some pre-submitted questions and also questions in the Q&A. Joining us for the Q&A session, we have um, Mo Niamwea, who's an open educational coordinator for Spark. In this role, she provides support across Spark's open education programs with an emphasis on grassroots organizing, communication, and advocacy. She's most passionate about equity and supporting marginalized communities. We also have Will Cross, who's a lawyer and librarian and serves as the director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at NC State University Libraries. I have some prepared questions, but I wanted to offer um, Mo and Will an opportunity for any comments before we go into the question period. I'm happy to share one. I don't want to step on Mo because I'd, I'd love to hear from her first. But um, if not, I, I first I want to say thank you to all the presenters. This has been really, really powerful and exciting. And I want to sort of restate and reaffirm a couple of things that I heard in the space. Uh, I'm currently working on an open educational resource that's a textbook. And this question about um, making something that is that reflects many voices and many experiences is something that we've spent a lot of time wrestling with. Um, any static text is necessarily hierarchical and limited in terms of who it reflects. So the power of an open license to, to bring in different voices and different experiences and the power of fair use to make sure those discussions reflect the authenticity and the lived experiences of those people, I think is really, really central. So I've, I've really appreciated hearing the discussion and, and wanted to reaffirm that sense that, that there's a two-step dance that's happening here. One, the open license says this isn't just Will's perspective or just Meredith's perspective. This is many people's perspective, I think is really critical to, to the work we've been talking about today. Um, and then the, the ability of fair use to say, and it's not just somebody you can get permission for. That if, that if I'm asking a student in my course to, to talk about their lived experiences and they say something that's important to me is a song that's been popular in the spring. Sorry, that doesn't have an open license. You can't talk about that. You can't play that. Um, it, it becomes less authentic. So I, I really appreciated this discussion. It's, it's really uh, been a great way of talking about the importance of the open license and fair use sort of coming together to make a more um, what uh, Rajiv Janyani and Robin DeRosa call empowering collaborative and just architecture for learning. Thanks, Will. Mo, thank you for joining us. Do you have any comments you'd like to add before we go to questions? Um, you're muted, I think. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to really reiterate what Will said. Um, this was a really excellent discussion, really important, always timely. Um, so thank you for putting this together. Um, yeah, I think that I, I just want to like reiterate some of the things that I felt were um, were important and said by the speaker. So I feel like Sabia really hit home on the point that accessibility can have different meanings and different interpretations depending on the context. So like a lot of people hear accessibility and the first thing that comes to their mind is um, like physical accessibility or like reading accessibility um, or, you know, those, those kinds of things. But I think that accessibility, um, we need to like expand our, our working understanding of what accessibility can mean in education. Um, and in general, I think that that will make education so much more um, inclusive for, for people who think different, for people who um, feel differently inside but don't know what that means yet. Um, so, yeah, I think that, that was a really important point. And then um, Jasmine's point of, of kind of like, if we were to take history at face value from traditional textbooks, you would think there were no gay people. And that is so true. Um, and I think it's really important to not just like acknowledge that that historical revision happened, but to actively kind of work to undo it and unravel these stories and, um, you know, historical figures who might, you know, inspire someone to take a different course in their life or to um, do something they previously thought that they couldn't do if they if they're able to see somebody who, uh, you know, was a genius in, in some field they thought they could never break into, who, who looks like them or who presents, their, uh, presents like them. So, um, yeah, I think that queer people deserve to know their own history. And um, also, everyone can learn from, from queer culture. The idea of chosen family, I think, is, is really important. Um, and and, and everyone, everyone can learn from concepts like that. Um, just as we have learned our whole lives from heterosexual culture. Um, and yes, that, those, were, those were my thoughts. But yeah, this, this was a really great discussion and I'm excited to get into the questions. Thank you. So for the questions, I'm gonna read them out loud so they're available for the recording. And I would encourage panelists um, who wanna to respond to go ahead and unmute themselves and jump in. Um, so uh, there's two questions in the chat that talk about um, how for people who are um, allies to this effort, but not themselves LGBTQ identified to sort of support this work. And there's a question in the chat of how to, if you want to work towards broadening authorship, how to do that um, in a way that doesn't sort of disproportionately burden people who um, self-identify as queer and so reaching out to broaden authorship without sort of um, pigeonholing people or sort of putting the burden of being sort of representative of their communities on them over and over again. So um, I'd open this up to any of the commentators and I think one maybe baseline thing I would say is you know we know right now that the ways we assign authorship disproportionately value seniority and so to the extent that seniority in academia often lines up with sort of traditional privilege, we see seniority um, selecting people who are older, whiter, um, and more male than their students. And so one of the ways I think at a baseline is to sort of broaden your selection of authorship and presentations and speakers from just sort of going to seniority first. So I think, you know, that's one way to do that, but I'd open it up to the anyone in the panel who'd like to comment. Zoe, do you have any experience in your program of trying to sort of recruit and support authorship to think through that question? Yeah, I, you know, the, the pieces that we kind of deal with in community are largely about creating a space that is welcoming in lots of implicit ways 
as well as the explicit ones. And I think that principle can be applied to, to other areas. So in, in the kind of the work that we support, uh, it, somebody has undertaken to, to create an OER of some kind and are then tasked with putting together with the team and sending out recruitment materials and all these different things where they're, you know, there are ways that you can build in explicit calls for, uh, you know, for queer representation in your team, make that a priority. Um, but you also have to be showing that you're doing that in lots of other ways as well. Um, and, and I think the, those, those implicit ways read to the right people um, when you're doing them well. And so again, to speak to, you know, if you're, if you're creating an institutional program, it's not just about your recruitment drive, it's also about who are you inviting to speak? Uh, who are you speaking to within your campus? What other work are you doing to, to advocate for queer people on campus? Um, all those ways are, are kind of complementary and in, in showing that the, you take the work very seriously. Um, that you're not just doing it to to tokenize, to check a box of oh well we need to have some some queer authors. So there's there are lots of ways that you can build out that space, as I say, that that, in, that invites participation and supports it um, in lots of ways beyond um, the, the checklist approach. Thank you. Um, another question that we got in the chat was for people um, in a community that is just starting to think about um, OER and creating OER and teaching materials. Um, what is, if you're a person who is trying to start the conversation about inclusion, what are the ways to do that? Um, I was wondering, Sabia, if you could talk about in the K through 12 space, what, you know, as you're, for example, working in a materials evaluation standpoint, or you're working to select curricular materials, what are the ways to maybe start the conversation about whether or not those materials are um, inclusive? Yeah, absolutely. I think I have two answers to this. The first one is that um, sort of unfortunately, excuse me, the, the, the burden, I guess, um, of creating queer and trans inclusive materials in K-12 at least often falls on queer and trans teachers and school administrators if, if they are there in a the particular school. Um, and so those are the folks who are sort of most affected by, by um, a lack of inclusion, uh, sort of taking on that work in schools. And, um, and I only say unfortunately because it, it is a lot of work to do all that, but um, a lot of schools do have groups. I think I saw referenced in a question, if you're not part of like an LGBTQ group or something similar, um, a lot of schools do have groups like that, whether it's a student group or like a teacher advocacy group or something, those are probably less common. But um, but I think both is the case in both K-12 and in higher ed, um, there's there's like some sort of group or person, even if it's just an individual, individual at a school who's thinking about um, these issues. And so starting by talking to those folks or that person at your school or your institution um, is I, I think a good starting place to see what work has been done um, if you don't know yet. And uh, if there's a way that you can help advance the, the other work that they're doing, or if you have ideas that you could bring to them as well, that's my first answer. My second one is that inclusion, right, as a sort of broad uh, idea and in whatever ways that we're thinking about it, um, can, can be in every conversation and in every setting um, and in all materials. So whatever conversation it is that you're in, um, just bringing that up, um, can be helpful in helping you find out what where other people are at in this, but also in normalizing um, queer and trans inclusion just in conversation at your institution, for example. So um, those are sort of the, the my two ideas around that. Thank you, Savia. And um, you know, maybe I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I think there's a there's been slow, hard progress in the United States education system to really normalize the idea that making materials accessible for students with disabilities is a core ethical responsibility. That, you know, this is not something that has always been true, but I think that, you know, if you come into a committee to review materials or committees to talk about teaching materials, and you bring up the point of, I don't know if these materials are accessible for all of our students with disabilities, that's a concern that generally people feel obliged to respond to. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of this is just pushing the, you know, questions about what you can do as an ally is to just keep pushing that question, not necessarily having the answer to like, this is how we do it, but to say, we have to ask this question. Um, 
And I think that'll be a, you know, that is a process, but I think there are ways in which tying questions about inclusion and representation um, to questions about other minimum standards we require of our materials. So this isn't sort of an optional social justice campaign, that it is a core standard for the materials that we use is a, is a process, but it's not something that I think people can keep asking that question because that has a power in itself. I think it also helps to, to raise these issues um, and this perspective even in, in every conversation that you're in, which sounds like a lot of work and it, and it can be, but, but the more it's done, again, the more it's normalized. And um, particularly in rooms, like Zoe mentioned, um, this, this idea of straight passing, which is a very real thing. And as someone who's sort of visibly, stereotypically queer, um, people, people see me in conversations and spaces and panels and whatever it is, and they sort of feel obligated to talk about this because they're making, you know, assumptions because they feel like a queer person is in their space and they have to talk about this. Um, but not all queer people look like me, right? You, you have no idea who's in the room when you're having a conversation. And so um, the, the sort of ubiquity of, of queerness and people who are affected by it being marginalized in, in conversations um, is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about you know, should, should I bring this up in this conversation or is this, is this worth um, just sort of noting here? And, and my answer is always yes, particularly if you're not uh, queer or trans yourself, because that gives you some, some sort of buffer, right? That gives you some agency in raising this on behalf of folks who might not be comfortable or feel like they can raise it in that space. Thank you. Um. Another question I wanted to talk about that had come up in uh, the chat and also in some questions earlier, and might be a question that Jasmine, I would ask if you'd be willing to give the first response to. Um, you mentioned this briefly in your slides, but it's really important, I think, not just to look for um, OER about queer studies or to look for um, LGBTQ authors for sort of niche topics, but to acknowledge that um, identity and experience and diversity matter for sort of teaching across the spectrum that whether you're teaching history or psychology or biology or um, a sort of broad range of different substantive disciplines that diversity of authorship matters. Um, would you be willing to talk about that a little bit and the ways in which um, OER has the potential to improve author diversity if we sort of actually work through, as you and Zoe talked about, the, the hard work of supporting a broader group of authors. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, you know, going back to my point, it, there's really an academic responsibility here that we have to make sure that we're at least trying to achieve because, you know, sometimes I hear this from faculty, including, you know, some of my colleagues, well, what about, um, you know, academic autonomy and all of that, well, again, there's, there's also to that an academic responsibility that we have to uphold in making sure that we're not just serving one group of people um, in, in academia and in education as a whole, including K through 12. Um, and, and maybe I'm being a little repetitive and not necessarily answer the question, but there, you do have to um, do the work. And I, I think that is also, um, you know, sometimes a barrier that we see. Um, in terms of trying to include other voices that we typically do do not see, including uh, queer voices and what have you, um, so there's there's that issue that we we obviously um, have to deal with. But um, now I feel like I'm rambling on. <laughs> Can you ask the question one more time? <laughs> well, just saying, you know, I think talking about why it's important to have uh, diversity of authorship for topics that aren't about the sort of specific yeah. access of of diversity, whether it's important to have, you know, um, queer people or people of color as authors for broad academic disciplines, not just for an area of specific study. So why it's important to have um, women of color as authors in right. biology or queer people as authors in history, not just for sort of specific areas of study. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Well, I mean, if, if you are trying to, you know, just from a, I don't want to say recruitment standpoint, but just from a, a student standpoint, if you do want to retain and recruit diverse students, I mean, <laughs> you kind of have to do that, right? Students are sick and tired of hearing the same, you know, voices and the same, 
you know, scholarship, if you will, they want to see themselves reflected in the material in some way. And, and, and we, we owe it to them in terms of providing more diverse authorship so that they can engage with the material in a more meaningful manner. And then just from the author's perspective, again, we're, we are implicitly and explicitly assigning value to people's lived experiences or to people's scholarship when we're constantly centering, again, only certain types of experiences. And then what are we saying in return when we don't have a diversity of authorship there? So that's, that's why it's important. You know, we don't, we don't want to be, um, you know, re repeating the same information or like um, Seiko, oh gosh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce Siko's last name, but that's the, the phrase that I got from, you know, whose knowledge is reliable. And she talks about how, you know, cisgender white men are only 20% of the global population. And yet they're, they're writing for 80% of the global population. That's a problem there. <laughs> that math doesn't add up. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's another reason why this, this issue is, is, is particularly imperative. I think that's a really good point. We can't expect to do good work of having materials that are that are broadly representative if we're asking the same small group of people to create. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, one question we get that's a little bit more in the nitty gritty of um, open licensing that I'll introduce and I might say a little bit about and I'll open to the group is there's this worry, I think, that um, if you create teaching materials around something that um, has a sort of social justice or ethical context. So teaching about um, gender and sexual identity or creating teaching materials where you take those issues very carefully, that there's this risk that if you release those under an open license, that they might be misused through either ill intent or just incompetence. That I'm gonna work really hard to create this carefully crafted teaching resource and someone else with bad intent is going to come and make it worse. They're going to make it racist or homophobic or sexist. And there's that worry about that piece with the open license. Um, and I've heard that worry a lot, um, but my core um, belief about that and what I've seen in the work I've done for the last 10 years is that mostly people with bad intentions do not carefully obey uh, open licensing standards. So, you know, Sabia linked earlier to a lot of really high quality teaching materials from teaching tolerance. And those are really important and they're sought out by people who have a priority for, for using um, inclusive teaching materials. If that's not your pedagogical focus, if you have a very different view of that, if you want to teach sort of very traditional conservative um, content, you're not going to start with those materials and make them worse. You're going to start with material that is um, sort of more traditional or conservative in the first place. So I don't think we see a lot of that bad faith reuse. Um, and I don't think specifically we see an enabled by fair use or by uh, uh, open licensing, sorry. And then the other part I think is this second thing, which is a little bit more subtle, which is materials that are created very carefully by authors who've thought deeply about issues of representation or inclusion that are going to be made uh, less carefully considered by adapters and reusers. And I think that is possible that, you know, materials that you've created very carefully will be changed. And I think two things are true there. One is all teachers change materials when they deliver them, whether they're under an open license or not, right? High quality teaching materials cannot change teachers' perspective or behavior, right? Those teachers are either good teachers doing good work or they're not, but that isn't something that can be cured by the teaching material. And the other is, I think that the benefits of the flexibility of allowing teachers to tailor materials outweigh the, the costs of letting them change them. Um, but I know that, uh, Sabia, you've heard this concern before. I don't know if other people on the call have, but I'd be open to hearing any sort of perspectives or questions there. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, I have heard this question a lot, almost every time that I <laughs> go to a conference and talk about this. Um, and it's a, like you said, Meredith, it's a valid concern and, um, and it is a possibility, right? You people, people can change these materials for better or for worse. Um, and I think, I think even more what you said is, is true also that, that folks sort of 
um, who have ill intent are not going to first seek out teaching tolerance resources as a starting point um, for their racist and homophobic materials. But I think uh, maybe more often than that, the concern is that people who have good intent, um, but who haven't done quite enough of the work to um, to get it you know, quite right, are going to try to manipulate these things in ways that are going to end up being more harmful than, um, than helpful. And this is, this is a risk too, I think, like, like you just said. And, um, and to that, I usually say that um, you know, the materials are not the entire solution. They're not the thing, right? They're the vehicle for the thing. And the thing is um, better pedagogy. And so I, I would suggest that just teaching, teacher training is, um, is just as important a piece as the resources and the materials themselves. Um, and that's something that we're thinking about constantly too um, at New America about what you know high quality teacher training looks like as particularly in the k-12 context but i think it's relevant for higher education too um, because there's you know there's queer content that is like queer history and books centering queer and trans um, protagonists that are their stories about them and then there's sort of all the other content and the other subjects that are out there they can also be made to be inclusive um, that aren't sort of specifically like queer about queer identities explicitly um, and and within that sort of large scope of content there's there's all kinds, there's like a big spectrum, right, of, of how inclusive or who you're centering or all of these things um, that sort of change within that. And so um, it takes a lot to understand that. And like, this is work, right? Like it's, it's work to understand these things. And, um, and the work doesn't really end because, because our understandings of queer and trans people, you know, evolve, um, like, like was mentioned earlier. And so um, all that is just to say that the teacher training is a big part of this too. And, um, and that's why I think that groups at, at your institutions, at your schools, whatever it is, who are already doing this work, if those groups exist, are a good place to start and a good place for um, maybe to be a resource also if you're the person creating these resources and putting them out to ensure that um, maybe other folks at your school, your institution, who are looking to use these um, can do so in a way that is as um, helpful and productive for students as you were intending it to be. Thanks. If I might uh, chime in no. a little bit, um, yeah, I, I, I think sometimes that question, and again, maybe I'm making some assumptions here, I think sometimes that question can also, you know, it obviously addresses the issue of quality, but I think sometimes, it, at least in academia and higher education, it comes from a fear of sharing, right? So in, in, in higher education, we publish in closed journals. Um, you know, a, a lot of our stuff is closed. It's very insular, and that makes us feel safe about our work and when you put that open license on it it's like oh wait 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 so i i have to share this now with the public oh no 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 we don't do that in the academy um so i i, I think there's a some conflation going on there sometimes that um educators in higher ed aren't realizing that yes there is the issue of quality which is always so interesting right you know anytime people think of something that is free or openly licensed they automatically think that it's poor quality and i've I've bought some textbooks um, that aren't that great, <laughs> you know, and I still had to, to buy them. But anyways, um, I also think there is this, with that issue of quality, there is also this feeling of, I'm scared to share my work, or I'm scared to, you know, there's some instructors who are scared to even share their syllabi, you know, on a public website. So I think there's a little bit of that going on as well. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right that putting it out into the open license means it sort of goes out into the wild and you have to tolerate all of the uncertainty and exposure that that means. Um, Jasmine, there's a follow-up question in the Q&A about quality and the perception of quality in higher ed, which is that, you know, one uh, sort of gatekeeping function that happens is that uh, in higher ed, we have a lot of really established ways that faculty evaluate and perceive quality. And um, wanted to see whether you thought that was one way in which sometimes uh, queer voices are like suppressed or devalued because it's a different perspective and because that, that difference or that critical perspective isn't valued in higher education. Have you seen that at all? Yeah, I, I do, unfortunately, um, with a lot of the journals or even, you know, editors of books that we're using here, a lot of them tend to be 
um, you know, white, straight, um, gendered as cisgender male or man. Um, so, you know, there's that. The gatekeepers tend to have those type of identities. And then, you know, there seemingly um, appears to be an unwillingness to even try to learn that there's another way of thinking about a concept uh, or proven upon a concept in your particular discipline. So I definitely think there's that. Um, I also think there's this, and again, I'm, I'm kind of radical when I say this, I think there's this notion in, in higher ed that um, if something is peer reviewed, that means it's high quality. Um, and I'm here to tell you that, I, again, I've never been an editor before for a journal, but I have colleagues who have, and they've told me how they were very frustrated that, you know, in more ways than one, um, you know, there was a research study that was approved to be published when they didn't think it was of, of high quality. So I always caution faculty to, you know, really interrogate this notion of peer reviewed as a, you know, um, solution to the quality cost. I'm not saying that we should not go through the peer review process, but there are other ways in vetting the quality of educational materials. Thank you. Um, and then for about closing up, but I wanted to go back to something that Sabia had said about how this is work. And I wanted to recognize that it's work to improve our teaching materials and it's work to improve our pedagogy, but in one way or another, whether it's um, acting as an author or doing um, training or serving as a leader or reviewer in a program, a lot of that work falls to queer people. And I think it's important as we uh, evaluate in this in context of open is to be really deeply skeptical of volunteerism. A lot of the um, core values of open educational resources are really tied to sort of volunteer work and doing things for free. But um, you know, in Zoe's charts, we saw that the, the intern population was more diverse than the editor population, but interns are often either unpaid or underpaid. And so as we do this work, I think it's important to be aware that it is work to voice these issues, it is work to do educational work, and that having money in the same way that we pay for um, other areas of support or evaluation, paying for um, training for professional development, for people to be reviewers, that that pay is often really important, um, particularly when we're asking people who have um, traditionally been marginalized or who may not have the same um, sort of ability in a late career professor to do things for free, that I think that's really important. And I was wondering whether um, any of our panelists, um, Mo particularly, I know you've thought about ways to support um, people doing work, Mo, Sabi, and Zoe, anyone, or Jasmine would like to talk about that? It's always dangerous asking a large group of people to volunteer. But um. I can say a little something on that. Actually, I got the same response to a presentation I gave just earlier this week about open peer review and um, the work that needs to go into, you know, building in safeguards and policies and, and you know, doing whatever you can to ensure that there isn't bias in, in open peer review. And the response is, that sounds like a lot of work. And yeah, it, it absolutely is. Um, and I, what has stuck with me is something from Jess Mitchell. Um, and I won't get the quote quite right, but the sentiment that I took away from hearing her talk about this is every decision we make, we are deciding who we have come, like who we're willing to leave behind, who we're living, willing to leave out. And so if we decide that we don't do this work, we are deciding that we are leaving queer and trans students out of, of the conversation and, and on, on the out and on the margins of their classrooms. So we have to choose to do this work, acknowledge that it is more work than the alternative, but the alternative includes other choices, essentially. Um, and so making space and time and allocating resources to doing this work well will necessarily take away from from other things um but we 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 have to to figure out ways to do it um if we aren't comfortable with leaving students and also you know creators um from marginalized groups on the margins essentially within academia 
Thanks, Zoe. Um, and so we're just winding up. I just want to give each uh, panelist a chance for any last thoughts. I'm just going to go through sort of in the order you show up on my screen. Um, Jasmine, I just want to thank you again for joining us and for talking um, about these sort of important issues in higher ed and offer you an opportunity if you have any last thoughts for the group before we sign off. Yeah, um, you know, thank you for inviting me. This has been a really um, engaging conversation. I, I have even learned some things and, and, and I think that's the um, important piece here is that this is going to be a commitment beyond the projects that you're, you're working on, right? Um, that's beyond even OER in terms of being intentional about how inclusive your classroom experience will be, how inclusive your research program will be, how inclusive your scholarship. And, and all of that will be so just just make sure that you know for those who are listening in that this is definitely not a race <laughs> you're gonna have to pace yourself with this because it can be a little overwhelming thinking about i need to include these voices and those voices and, and this that and the other um just again pace yourself and be open to learning more and more thank you and thank you for joining us uh, mo would you like to add any last thoughts I was on mute again. <laughs> um, yeah, I just I just want to um, thank you for inviting me to join this conversation. This was really awesome, and um, yeah, I just feel like the emphasis on the connection between broadening representation and authorship is really important, and um, definitely one of the key takeaways from this discussion. So I hope that um, this really helps people and yeah okay. thank you so much for joining us um and uh zoe would you like to add any last thoughts yeah just i uh, really like to thank the the others on this panel and and you meredith for the opportunity as jasmine said it's you know we're all still learning in in our different ways on this and i i certainly am um i think i've joked before that I do queer OER work because anything I do is queer in a way, but I don't always necessarily apply this lens to it. So it's it's been a really wonderful opportunity to do that. And, and I hope there are some things that people can take away and take as their first steps um, in applying, the, in applying uh, what we've discussed to their own work. Thank you. Um, Will, would you like to add any last thoughts? Just to echo what what others have said, that thank you all so much for for sharing this. This has been really powerful and really exciting. Um, that the idea that that this is always a work in progress, that we're always sort of iterating and getting better, is I think core to to all of the work, whether it's the open licensing stuff or the inclusion stuff. So I, I love the the sort of harmony between those those areas of work. So thank you for keeping continuing to do it. Uh, Sabia, would you like to, as my my co organizer, give your last thoughts? Sure. I, I'll echo everyone else and say thank you to, to all the other panelists and thank you to all the attendees who took the time to join today. It's encouraging to see so many people show up for this and, and want to be learning and talking through um, some of the challenges of this work because I know there are um, there are a lot. It's not just uh, something that happens automatically or overnight or easily even. Um, and I, I want to underscore uh, a word that Jasmine just used too, which was intentional. I think for me, uh, the key to a lot of this work is that is doing it with intentionality, right? Um, no matter what position you're in, no matter what identities you hold, to be aware of both yourself and the agency and the privileges that you bring uh, or don't bring to this work, and um, to be aware of that in relation to whom and with whom and for whom you're doing this work, um, and to do it with intention because. Um, that's just that's the key to this right it's it's no coincidence that queer and trans folks aren't included aren't um shown and reflected and represented um and so it's uh it takes an equal amount of intention um to to address that issues and sort of work through all of these challenges thank you and thank you for helping organize this sabia um or really for organizing it. i it would be incorrect to say that I, you helped i helped you put this on but um I think just to close out, I would say, you know, across um, the topics that we're covering in this webinar is sort of a theme of having to take, to do work and take risks to do a better job of teaching. And I think that whether the, the work you're doing is understanding and engaging with um, open licensing and 
copyright or the work you're doing is to sort of reevaluate your teaching and your materials about whether or not they are um, supportive and effective for your students by being inclusive, that that work has to be tied to your mission to doing good teaching. And so I think that Sabia's um, statement about you know, keeping in mind for whom you are doing this work is really crucial. So thank you all for joining us. Um, we're gonna end the webinar now and the recording and the slides will be up uh, next week. Thank you all, bye.